If you had actually set out with the intent purely of quality, you would have ended up here anyway. It's all related to quantum physics. What might seem to be airy-fairy now, I think in five, ten years it will be mainstream. As a wine importer, I went to see what this was all about. And it was a place called Domaine de Marcou. A guy called Philippe Armand Nier said, you know, read this. And I thought, this is extraordinary. This is, this is, you know, this stuff about Rudolf Steiner, and it was about the alignment of the stars and astral this. And I thought, you know, this guy's taking the piss. In layman's terms, it's just you're more focused on what you should do. With, with organic, you've got a, a list of things that you're not allowed to do. With biodynamic, you're more focused on the health of your soil. Look to nurture diversity on your farm. And he showed me you know, the vineyards, and bit by bit, it started to sort of make sense. It's a hard concept for people to grasp, but it's for the farm to become a sentient organism, self-aware and to develop its own identity. What appeared to be a cranky, ridiculous load of nonsense started to make sense. This is how he's suddenly come from nowhere to be one of the greatest, you know, Chateauneuf producers. And I thought, wow. You know, we're at a time in human history where we're feeling that we've reached the limits of what we've done, shortcutting the system, and now we're actually having to try to boost the health of the system pictured the farm as a whole organism and treated with respect. It is a very empathetic and sympathetic understanding to how not just things work on this planet, but also, you know, in the surrounding planets, if you like, how, how they have an influence. It's not an easy subject to get across because it's a bit like muck and magic, you know? And it does depend on how receptive your audience might be. When you're that weird already, you know, it is just come naturally. I'm only interested in flavour. That's all I'm interested in, yeah. is flavour. The more natural, the purer, the more intense. That's what intrigues me. It is a thing that you're into or you're not. I mean, you couldn't make someone do it. It has to be a passion. The people that take it on are generally quite inquiring minds that are willing to do their own research and, and educate themselves. The biodynamics make the minerals available and then the plant pulls up whatever it needs. In conventional farming, it's forced on it. It's not a battle every day. It's a case of you're trying to work with nature and as opposed to looking at that dock and saying, how am I going to hammer that into submission? You're going, well, why is that there? What is it telling me? And what can I do to make conditions that it won't want to be there? It's an awful lot more bird song and a lot more in insect life on our farms. The wildlife can tune into energies and uh, the sense of a place and what diversity is in a place and flock to it. I get all my tillage work done on contract and the contractor says, every time I come here, I say, it just reminds me of what soil was like 30 years ago. I say, that smell. Every other farm I plough is conventional. Mm. And he says, just this, that smell. And he says, just, just magic, he says. Mm. He, hasn't, he hasn't smelt it for 30 years, so that'll just tell you, like, you know. You know, and that's where it ties in very well with what Waterford is doing, is this whole idea of terroir, of having plants that are well able to, to find their nutrients in the soil and have them express themselves and their potential in the best possible way. We just, at some point in the 2000 years of agricultural history, figured out with a light bulb moment, we could shortcut this whole system. But don't forget, it was a good system. The more diversity you have above ground, the more diversity you have below ground. I met Mark and I was chatting to him and I said, well, I've just started uh, applying uh, biodynamic preps and I'm starting to get into biodynamics. And he said to me, well, you grow biodynamic barley, Trevor, and I'll buy it off you. I'm interested in going back to the basics of how barley evolved with an environment and it suited the terroir, it suited the environment and you got more individualistic flavours as a result and yet we've been so clever, we've sort of bred it out. I just think that's a real shame. I'm looking back to where the, these flavours were original and authentic in league with that, a propagation methodology that accentuates that naturalness. It's all about a living soil, having a soil that's actively living. 
not compacted by heavy tractors, aerated so that organisms can live. I can remember my ma one day said, oh, well, we must prune the roses. And I said, right, fine, okay, all right, I'm, I'm ready. She said, no, 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 not now. We've got to wait till the moon is descendant. And you what? Because the sap is rising and it falls when it's uh, descendant. Uh, but like the tides do, you know, the spring tides and the neap tides. An old wives' tale, yeah on one hand, but on the other, you know, it's, it makes sense. It's accumulated knowledge. I certainly wouldn't be applying perhaps on a, on a black day, which is a day that you shouldn't be really doing any, any field work. It's to do with the cycle of the moon around the Earth. So as it's passing through the orbit of the Earth around the sun, that's a peregrine moon and that's a black day. No one will argue with you that the moon brings the tide in and out but it also affects us and it affects plants. And it'll bring the sap up in the plant and it'll let the sap back down into the roots. You're cutting the stem and all the energy from the plant is in the roots. No one will argue with you that the sun is having an effect on us. We take it for granted every single day. The sun is 150 million miles away from us, but yet when the clouds clear, you can feel the heat of it on your neck and you go, I better get some sun sunscreen. So how is it so surprising that the moon will also have an effect on us? There's lots of different levels to biodynamics, and that's a very high level, you know, to really be that in tune with the moon. This part of the Western world, you know, it's not so easy. People go over lunar phases for the sowing, but never actually heard about it for the cutting. They've read that, you know, it does have a significant effect on, you know, the harvest of timber as well, in terms of its moisture content and things, so... If you think that this is it, even though it's a black day, that intent will transfer to your crop. That's... It's an energy transfer, correct, really. Correct. It's the sort of culmination of, you know, since the last ice age, 15,000 years of farming know-how. Knowledge is so vital that we, we need to share it from each other. We need to learn from each other because without learning from each other, you know, we're all making the same kind of mistakes. So we have to work together and work with each other. But it's gone through a number of evolutions over the years and it's at a very vibrant time at the moment as a result of perhaps more people's awareness. And now with Waterford on board as well, I think that will develop more interest in what we do. a list of the top 20 greatest winemakers in the world and three quarters of them will be following the biodynamic regime. It's a, a way of life. The, the principle of biodynamics is that everything you need is on your farm. Composts that are super efficient. You take cow's horns and you fill them with, with manure and you bury them and they compost and become extremely, extremely powerful. There's two names for it. It's called horn manure and 500. The more attention to detail with the process of making them and of using them, the better results you get. To make 500, you take a, a horn and you stuff the horn with the manure and you bury that horn. It's like a, a good wine. The longer it's in storage, the better it'll be. The horn is described as a kind of a sheath. They're considered in biodynamics kind of there a sense organ, if you like. We are apparently dealing with non-materialistic forces, you know, or subtle energies in that sense. It's not a faith-based thing. It's not something we believe in that sense. It is functional. You know, we, f we see with our eyes that something that works, but we do respond and very much respect kind of subtle energies. The spirituality around farming isn't, isn't really talked about an awful lot, but it's there. You talk to farmers and they have a certain connection with the land, certain connection with their own farms. And, you know, that's sort of where we're at, honing in on that a little bit more. The very powerful agrochemical industry does not want to see any movement that tells you not to use agrochemicals. You know, the more fertiliser you use, the more yield you'll get think about the fact that that cabbage or that potato has chemicals in it. The chemicals have been applied to the potato on a regular basis, so the chemicals are in it. You can't wash them off. They're a part of it. There will be a tipping point where people just go, you know, it just changes right the other way to just not being acceptable anymore. Intensive farming was understandable. It was encouraged out of necessity, two world wars. So in the post-war years, yields trebled, but the quality went through the floor. It was just vacuous, bland, you know, it ended up with the European wine lake where they couldn't give the stuff away. By the 80s and 90s, the industrial volumes that they were putting down to get those high yields had resulted in a pan about a metre and a half under the soil of decomposing nitrates. And it was making wines very acidic. And I can remember growing up in the wine world, my father saying, oh, you know, white, white burgundy, it's got to be at least 10 years old because of the acidity. But he didn't know what they had to do was dig up this layer of nitrates. You, you don't need to be an eco-loon to, 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 to realise that that doesn't make sense.
like with, you know, some of the vegetables I come across in supermarkets, I just feel sorry for them. They just seem sad and very unloved. I mean, they have, and you know, they've been just t dealt with just by machines all their lives. You just, you know, because you're kind of used to vibrant food around you. You go and come across food like that, it just feels sad. We're looking at doing this organic and biodynamic project and comparing it to conventional, which actually in the history of agriculture is a short period of time. We've had mm. 2,000 years of agriculture. Before that, I was think it was a click and collect kind of, um, what do they call that kind of uh, berry picking and that kind of stuff. Hunter gatherer stuff. Hunter gatherer yeah. kind of stuff. So, I mean, what's going to happen over the next 10, 20 years? Like, some of the work we're doing is kind of foundational for how things are going to be later on. The fact that Waterford was interested in buying biodynamic barley was really a, a, a big push for the three of us to, to produce it, you know. I took them up on their word and said, look, you know, I'll show you what's needed. And I took them to Alsace, Eastern France, seeing biodynamics in action. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. That was with Mark, and it was kind of our inaugural trip to kind of set us off on our path. The wines were just out of this world, really. Alsace has always been a, quite a good stronghold for biodynamics. They are so passionate about what they do that if they sense that you are equally fascinated well then, you know, you're a like-minded soul. Again, it kind of maybe gives an indication of the journey of terroir as well, because it certainly would have been by the same growers, but actually grown on different mineralities of soil. You could taste it, certainly in the glass. Everybody caught the idea of what it's about. You could see it with wine, you could see how these composts and the soil and, and the richness of soil, using horses to plow these steep hills. The whole concept, the end result, you taste it in the wine. You know, this intensity of flavor. It just had more. And that's when you realize that, wow, here you're seeing the greatest of the great, and it's still just got more something else. Definition, intensity, it's just a little more. There's just a, a more of a depth of uh, flavor, and there's a, a texture to it as well that you that you know with anything that's produced biodynamically. It's something that you, ha you haven't got in your library of experiences that it just blows you away. This is Hunter. Oh, I'm much happier with this variety now. It has established much better and it's got a better density and height. I'm highly impressed with the root development of it, you know, the actual yeah. volume of root compared mm. to a standard variety. Mm. He, was yeah. finding it, he was finding it hard to even pull it up. Yeah, they're good and strong, yeah. It feels like these heritage varieties are more suitable for this way of farming. Definitely does, Definitely, yeah. yeah. Well, that's why we're very interested in using old Irish varieties that are bringing back that older genetic material and bringing them forward. It's a work in progress, and uh, in fairness, the progress has been quite good so far. Like, and the proof will be in the bottle, I'm sure. Will the Camelina write the same time as the Barney, John? I'm telling it to, yes. I'm giving these psychic intent. <laughs>with the more distant planets in our solar system. In the same way, these work with their individual different planets as well, controlling different transformative functions within the compost heap. The Earth breathes in and out and during different seasons of the year and during different parts of the day. It's not something we have to kind of adhere to in any sense, but you're aware of it. 501, which is the other sort of central prep, quartz crystal, ground up into a very fine powder. You want to have it applied before 11 o'clock in the day, so the Earth is breathing out. And as the earth is breathing out, this, the spray is taken up into the atmosphere. If you get your processes right and you apply it well, it's like giving you an extra two days of sunlight. And I've had farmers driving into the farm and they go, there's a, a real glow and a shine off the soil. Farmers growing biodynamically barley in Ireland, you know, guys that have risen to this challenge that I posed, this question, you know, how can we make, you know, even more flavoursome whiskey? I'm really proud and pleased. Everyone asks about the biodynamics. Really? Everyone asks. Really? Yeah. Oh, well, that's good. Like, everybody loves an appreciative audience. And when you find people are really enjoying your produce and getting good feedback, because the reality is, of, of all the farmers in Ireland, very few ever get any feedback of any sort. Yeah. 
and nobody ever says, you know, well done or good job, you know. So our stuff tends to just go out there to the ether and never, we never get to meet the customer and nobody ever says good job. So we don't get to learn that much maybe about our output and we're hoping to learn a lot more through this release of the, the water barley. I mean, we can't wait for really all the feedback we'd hope to get there. What ultimate flavour profile is it going to have? We don't know. This feels like a social experiment. <laughs> so this is Luna 1.1. It's almost like a constellation of stars. We'll taste it neat first. Trevor Harris, John McDonnell, Alan Mooney, the three amigos. So this spirit is three years, two months, one day. No pressure, Grace. This is a big moment for us all. <laughs> You can spend your week in that nose and it's brilliant. It's more complex, it really is. That's the only way to describe the nose on that. So much of what's out there today has been sort of burbered out of it. They've made it more homogenised and more drinkable, so we kind of lost the definition of whiskey in many ways. You know, so this brings back old-fashioned whiskey. The depth in it is incredible, yeah. In that sense, there's so much information in that glass. There's a lot of complexity there. I mean, that is deluxe leather. That's a lot of good stuff in there. But what we do is almost, in some sense, like a ritual practice, and then actually having the liquid, you know, and tasting it feels like, you know, a reverential religious practice in its own sense. Here where it's grown, exactly. Yeah. It's full circle. It is a triumph now to get to this point. Before this, did you kind of feel out on your own? Absolutely, yeah, of course. I mean, we were producing stuff, but it just had to go into the general organic market. There wasn't a place for it. This is the first time somebody wanted to receive it and put it in its proper place. And, and it can be recognised for what it is. Yeah, often it is difficult for us to find our market out there and then to explain that our quality is different and better. So it's so much easier to be pulled than to be pushing. It is, look, it's just a game changer. It's just something quite different, quite different. Do you want to know my little secret? Yes, please. You're afraid, but I'll tell you. <laughs> huh? I'm always afraid when you start When you're talk. doing... <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'd like to know I have that effect on women. Anyway, put a little bit of what you've got, that old mix, into your stirring barrel when you're stirring. Put a tiny little drop of the whiskey. There was always that Irish tradition of putting a little bit out in the ground for the spirits or whatever. Put a little bit of what you've got in your bottle into your stir that's going to go in your barley. Let the barley know what it's been doing. Let it know what it's been at. Yeah. It makes sense. 